Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I was going to say sunny, but I know it's been kind of hit or miss. Uh, my name is Carolyn Keough. I'm the Director of Education at the Alana Partnership. I'm so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Um, the Alana Partnership is a nonprofit that works in close collaboration with New York State Parks, the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And we're so fortunate to have also worked with David Hart over the past couple of months and beyond um, to put together a fabulous exhibition called Terraforming, which we're going to be talking a little bit about today. I also just want to thank Diane, um, who's here with us, who I know wants to remain anonymous, but who is, has been an essential part of getting um, the Fern Garden restored to put together one of David's and to host one of David's very important pieces as part of the show, one of the contemporary um, Excuse me, the mic is acting a little funky, um, but one of the contemporary pieces that are in the show. So before further ado, um, I am going to welcome David. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank and we can project if the mics. Maybe? I think we might just project, David. Does that work for you? It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I prefer it. I'm an educator, so that's my, my mode of operation. Um, I'm so excited to chat with you today. Terraforming has been a wonderful way of highlighting some of Church's historic photography collection, many photos that have never been seen before, but it's also been a, a wonderful way of bringing and unearthing some important themes, which I know we're going to talk about today. Um, I have to do my due diligence and read your wonderful and impressive bio, so let me do that. Um, David Hart lives and works in Philadelphia, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania. His work unpacks the social, cultural, and economic complexities of his various subjects. He explores how historic ideas and ideals persist or transform over time, and this is extremely prevalent in the show that we have on view through the end of October here at Olana. David's solo exhibitions include The Histories at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, Colored Garden at the Glass House in Connecticut, and the group exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art. His work is in the public collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and other venues, and we're very, very honored to have you here with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think, you know, a place where I would love to start our dialogue, if it's okay with you, is thinking a little bit about um, how this show came to be. You know, we're going to be talking about what the show is, but I'd love to hear more about how the work and this display of historic photographs track that journey for us and maybe within the context of your own artistic journey as well. How did this project come about? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of kind of intersecting um, narratives. Um, I was, um, my introduction to um, uh, you, you all here at um, Olana came through a an online um, conference or um, colloquium uh, organized by Columbia University um, a couple of years ago on uh, the status of uh, historic preservation and monuments, and I was invited uh, to be in dialogue with a number of other uh, practitioners and uh, uh, was able to talk about a project that I had up um, at uh, the Glass House in Connecticut. And um, uh, Will Coleman, uh, the former curator uh, here, um, he had uh, attended uh, that and um, so he was familiar with that. But I think I also talked a little bit about uh, another arc of work called the Histories, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, and the third part of, of the histories, which uh, dealt with concepts of diaspora and um, essentially what I took, I, I, I did was I took Herodotus' uh, kind of history of the Mediterranean and the Levant region from the 5th century BC uh, and transposed it to uh, the Caribbean and the Americas in the 19th century as just a kind of a different model for exploring diasporic movement of peoples and, mm -hmm. and, and, and cultures and exploring pace, place through those narratives. Um, but the third part of the histories, um, um, in each case, I really focused on using almost the ciphers to kind of guide us through the histories of place. I, I used um, artists, writers, musicians, 
Um, so in the first case, there was um, Louis Moral Gottschalk, who was a 19th century um, American composer, along with Robert Duncanson, um, uh, an African-American landscape painter who was loosely associated with church, um, as well as, you know, uh, Martin Johnson Heed. But the third, the third iteration of the histories, I dove deep into Frederick Church uh, and, and his practice, and specifically um, his explorations of uh, spaces outside of the Hudson River Valley, um, uh, quite specifically his, his travels in Jamaica mm -hmm. and um, in uh, Iceberg Alley, which is the area between uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, mm -hmm. uh, where at, in I think May or June of every year, the icebergs kind of flow through. Um, and Will kind of saw that and I think recognized, you know, a contemporary artist who was deeply interested and invested uh, in exploring church and his legacy. Um, and so um, it was very, very open invitation to come and start thinking about uh, possibly doing um, a, um, uh, a site-specific work here mm -hmm. at Olana. And I think that kind of dovetailed into uh, a number of other um, initiatives uh, that could perhaps use the perspective that I was bringing, and one of them was, since I was already investigating, you know, 19th century materials related to church, um, uh, um, and the, the photographic archive hadn't been fully explored, maybe this was an opportunity for me to kind of use that kind of investigative impulse to kind of dive along with you folks through that, that, that very, very rich um, uh, body of material. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for tracking that for us. And I think something that comes up, no, I think something that you highlight is just how wonderful it is to have a contemporary artist kind of here on site with us today in a site that, you know, was always a site of contemporary art. But also you mentioned, you know, this, this opportunity you got to kind of track and, and un, unearth and navigate through this immense archive of photographs that Church collected. And so, you know, something, it's a great privilege, I'm very envious of you, that you got to kind of go through and, and look through all of those photographs. But I'm really curious to hear what that was like for you as, a, as an artist, going through a fellow artist's ephemera, a fellow artist's collection. And what was that process like, and how did you kind of approach it? Because as many of you may know, if you visited the show, um, there's a, a selection of photographs that you kind of had to choose. We're working with limited wall space. So I'm curious, multi-part question, what that process was like and how you kind of landed on the framings that you did. Yeah, that's a great question and it is definitely two parts, so perhaps I'll focus first on the act of kind of going through uh, the collection and then perhaps secondly talk about uh, the framing mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe I think I'll talk about the framing mechanism <laughs> first. So I mean really what's important to me is when I'm invited to a site to, um, um, to do a work, um, not to lose focus in whom I am or what my interests are. And so what I really try and do is to use the site as the space that I can occupy uh, to introduce um, ideas that have been on my mind through the research of, over kind of a period of time and um, to figure out ways that it can intersect meaningfully. And part of a way of trying to um, engage and create meaning out of that is uh, through research. So it's a very kind of research intensive um, um, methodology where it, it, you know, it is about looking at who the individual is, what the history of the site is, and um, how I can begin, begin to kind of extrapolate uh, and find ways to kind of constellate things that were already on my mind. You know, and I think, I'm not a uh, psychologist, but you, you, you have a sense of awareness of, of, of you know, um, if you stare at a picture long enough, say, you know, in a certain color palette, and then when you go out in the world, you're going to start recognizing that color. And ideas are, for me, it, kind of similarly. Mm -hmm. So if I've been researching something, when I intersect with, you know, a site, it, I'm going to be looking for things that somehow kind of reflect the same mm -hmm. frequency. Um, now, intersecting with the archive, it's funny, I didn't characterize it as necessarily the archive of, a, of, of an artist. For me, it was mm. just this really rich, incredibly rich and deep um, amount of material that somebody had lovingly collected. Mm. That, um, uh, and so it was 
less as an artist and more as just like somebody who's deeply curious about the world. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and for lack of a better explanation, that's what I like to think that artists are. Yeah. You know, is that we have a great privilege of being deeply curious about the world and responding to it and being able to act upon those, those curiosities and to pursue it. And ultimately the work becomes an expression of following, you know, those questions that we have about the world and want to find answers for. And so I, I found in Church's collection this very kind of expansive mind that was thinking about place, that was thinking about history, that was thinking about culture, and that was processing and synthesizing it in interesting and new ways. I mean, we clearly see that in the expression mm -hmm. of, you know, the house and the, and, the, and the ground, somebody who was traveling the world very widely and bringing back those ideas and inspirations and influences and trying to make sense of it, but also responding to sight in a very, very mm. complex way. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you have the same kind of manis manifestation of co uh, complexity as one moves through, you know, the collection of photographs. You mm. start to see, um, you know, a man who was busily collecting all of the world had to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that term, lovingly collected. I feel like that's one that we, you know, many of us here at Alana kind of think a little bit about when we um, interrogate and call into conversation some of those collecting practices. I know that in the context of the commissioned contemporary pieces that you worked on, um, the church's fascination with ferns and ferns from Jamaica really seemed to call to you. And I, you know, want to call out Specimen, which if many of you haven't gotten a chance to see, it's at the very base of our historic approach, a personal favorite of mine, and one that's been really um, evocative for groups. But I would love to hear a little bit more about why that, that collecting process really spoke to you and, and your own navigation of it in the context of that, that work that you, that you worked on, Specimen. Yeah. So perhaps just to kind of finish the response to the last Please. question in yeah. terms of the framing mechanism, you know, terraforming was this something that I, was on my mind as um, a, a kind of metaphor to uh, be able to uh, try and understand uh, the layering of history and the kind of constant exchange that was happening between uh, human culture and the natural environment um, and the ways that with it, within which we are constantly replacing um, ourselves, mm. yeah? Um, and that was something that I did a piece, the MoMA piece, for instance, um, it's called on, on Exactitude in Science. And um, in that piece, I was invited to think about concepts of blackness um, in um, uh, architecture and design and how it's expressed through, uh, through space. And in fact, it's actually a very, very complicated problem because a space is totally contingent on how, who and how it's occupied. And so, you know, to say that this is a black space because I'm occupying it negates the presence of everybody else here, right? Um, and what I'm interested in is kind of much kind of broader entangled concepts of hybridity mm -hmm. um, and how spaces change and adapt to the occupations of different cultures. Um, and so at the terraforming work, I made it in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Watts um, and where I was exploring cinema is a really fantastic way to begin to understand either blackness or other kind of cultural positions in regards to space because it's driven through a narrative progression, you know, as the camera decides to frame and move through and describe space, we can edit or elicit very kind of particular perspectives. And one of the best films that did or described black space to me was um, Charles Burnett's uh, Killer of Sheep, 1978 film, I believe, just kind of canonical um, avant-garde black cinema. Um, and so I actually worked with Charles as a narrator um, to revisit Watts, the neighborhood that he grew up in and that was featured in the narrative. And then what I began to see in describing the space through my film was that while it is an important historically black neighborhood, it's now primarily a Latinx community. And that the, the landscape itself was being gradually terraformed to better express the positions of the current population. And so you saw that in the choice of plants, mm. in the style mm. of architecture, um, in the smells, in just like everything was slowly, very kind of uh, subtly, I guess over time, uh, but dramatically if you just go from then to now, uh, changing. And so it, it, it kind of revealed to me, I guess, mm. um, a, a metaphorical way within which I could begin to understand 
um, uh, a much broader um, uh, continuum. Mm. And for those, you know, I, the title of the exhibition catalog is Terraforming, the title of the show is Terraforming, a lot of historic photography collection on Earth. Define terraforming for us. I think it's a term that might, you know, be more familiar to some of us than others. I'd love to hear your definition of it and have unpack it for us. Yeah. Yeah. So terraforming is a a, 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 a term typically associated with science fiction, whereby, um, uh, in order for us as as humans to settle another planet, we would need to um, um, transform the atmosphere and the ecology of that of that space. To support, you know, so we would need water, we would need oxygen, we would need all of these, we would need, you know, vegetation and, and, and animals, and what they needed to live. So it would be a slow kind of transformation of that alien uh, site to better reflect the needs of, of Earth inhabitants. Uh, the opposite of terraforming is xenoforming. Uh, and so if we were settled by an alien uh, species, uh, they would slowly transform Earth to better reflect their needs in their environment, or an atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, terraforming is also a kind of colonial practice, right? What does it mean for one culture to come and settle on, um, you know, on another culture? And, you know, sometimes it's very deliberate, you know, through acts of conquest, and sometimes it's, you know, just a matter of, 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 of time as, as communities are abandoned and then bound by, by other cultures. Mm -hmm. And so, it also helped to kind of step back and kind of recognize that um, uh, terraforming as a concept um, uh, extended beyond, I think, the conversation that we are having right now, a deeply important one, but one that is really kind of focused on, say, the last 400 years of, of, um, of uh, history, mm -hmm. um, um, where both the practices of, of coloniality and the kind of post-colonial reckoning are still kind of being mm -hmm. worked through. Um, this was an attempt to kind of think much further back in time. And so uh, my choice in a number of the photographs uh, was an attempt to also, even though photography was only invented around what, 1839, um, uh, the sites that were actually photographed predate that by millennia. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so it was an attempt to kind of reach back, use photography to kind of reach back in time to kind of just describe that process that I was was yeah. alluding to, and even even the um, um, the piece um, a specimen is um, a description of you know it's not an act of uh, terraforming it's not simply a human act it's a geological act it's an act that um, uh, the plant kingdom is constantly you know um, also propagating as mm -hmm. it kind of settles the world. Um, I think what we've done through, you know, intermodal transportation routes is simply accelerated, um, you know, that, but, um, you know, as climate change um, is happening, um, we see uh, landscapes, you know, slowly transforming yeah. um, outside of the bounds that we've kind of set yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. uh, for it to take, yeah. It's interesting, and I feel as though the word alien is so inherent in the definition of terraforming, right, to understand that notion you need to think about and kind of hold place for the notion of what is alien. And in thinking more about that, it comes up quite a bit in the exhibition catalog, which I really, truly can't recommend highly enough. It's beautiful production and the um, photographs are fabulous, but the essays are as well. And in your essay in particular, this notion of the alien comes up. And, you know, in thinking more about that, I, I wonder your thoughts on, you know, how do you navigate the alien in your own work? I think this this term, I think, in some ways is ar an arbiter of a colonial impulse in and of itself, something that is alien or foreign. And so I just wondered if you had thoughts about that, thinking more about, about that. I mean, it's a very deep question. <laughs> and it, it, yeah, it goes to a lot of different places for me. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I'm very careful of with the work, although I'm crossing that boundary right now through a project that I'm doing for uh, the Musée de l'Art Contemporain in Montreal, where I'm actually inviting kind of aspects of my own biography and personal, personal history into something, and I'm, it's scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> 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 but 
but in general, I really try and ha have yeah. a kind of very uh, objective relationship with the subject. In fact, um, uh, most often the subject is chosen based on uh, its ability to uh, describe or concentrate um, a, specific, a specific idea, mm -hmm. right? So an example of that is um, I was thinking about uh, the concept of sovereignty, right? So we hear the term and we think we understand what it means, but in fact, it's a term that's being contested in, in really complicated ways, right? So we think about, um, you know, like offshore data havens, or we think about uh, global warming and shifting um, uh, shorelines. Mm -hmm. um, indigenous I, questions of sovereignty. In quest yeah. Questions of indigeneity, yeah. I mean, even land masses uh, themselves are kind of growing and shrinking in, in really complicated ways. I read a story about Singapore uh, growing uh, um, to accommodate a you know, growing population and a, um, and a growing economy. And part of the way that it's doing that is actually um, uh, purchasing land mass from other countries in the region. Hmm. So it began by purchasing uh, uh, sand and gravel from Malaysia and Indonesia until that was banned. And then it started going up to Vietnam. And so while one country is, is, is growing, another is, is, is shrinking. Um, and so sovereignty was this really kind of complicated idea that I was trying to work through. Um, and um, one of the things that I try and do with the work is to go to places where the idea is being actively contested or in crisis. And so I ended up going to the island of Tuvalu in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. which is um, one of the first places, a sovereign country, which will eventually disappear within the next 50 years because of global warming. The highest point on the island is about three feet on any of the atolls. Um, and, you know, it was a place where you could actually, you know, once the islands are, are entirely submerged, what happens to a sovereign people, right. you know? Right. Um, do they lose their sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Do they relocate? Uh, can they negotiate some kind of, you know, settlement? I mean, there's, it's really, um, but it shows the relationship between, you know, for me, it was a way within which I could illustrate the complexity of the subject. That doesn't mean that I don't care about the plight of the people of Tuvalu, but there is a kind of distancing mm. within which I can kind of explain and explore while having a kind of critical detachment. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there is something deeply important about the alien in terms of its uh, both ability to uh, reflect and refute. Mm you know, our own, our own position. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. If we're simply looking for empty vessels that we can fill with our own need, then we're not, we're not being very generous about the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. the alien is something which I think we can, we can learn a lot about ourselves and our own needs and desires and where they end and where we need to invite somebody else in and be open to yeah. what they need. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. You know, I, I have to, this, we didn't talk about your current project, but I have to ask, do you want to share anything about it? It seems you mentioned it's scaring, scaring you, <laughs> so I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to share anything about it with, with us here today, or we'll stay tuned? Well, I'm doing another, <laughs> I'm doing another related body of work, which is maybe easier to talk about, yeah. um, which is a kind of ongoing investigation in, and I go into this in the essay in the book, which is called Terraforming Xenoforming, but it's trying to think about, um, uh, uh, the world that we share, not only amongst us, you know, human individuals, but also with other forms of life, and the kind of decentering or kind of removing um, hierarchical structures to kind of recognize, I think, a kind of broader concept of a civic landscape. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I've been traveling um, uh, the world, <laughs> um, um, essentially doing botanical studies. Um, uh, following the history of photography, uh, but also photography's relationship with uh, the field of uh, botanical study and archaeology. Mm. Um, so in last May, I traveled to Rome, visiting many of the sites that are actually um, in, the, um, in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, this spring, I just went to uh, Northern Europe following um, many of the um, spaces that uh, Carolus Crucius and uh, uh, Carl Linnaeus, uh, two founders of the field of botany, uh, worked so in northern Sweden, the Netherlands, and in Germany. And um, then in two weeks, I'm going to uh, South Africa 
uh, to uh, look at uh, historic botanical gardens, which are actually the source of many, you know, kind of plants that we mm -hmm. kind of take for granted mm -hmm. as being uh, garden variety, kind of decorative, you know, um, uh, uh, plants, and um, finding them in, I don't want to say where they came from, but, you know, in, in the kind of community that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that they originally thrived in. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talked in that project, you're, you're kind of mining the relationship between um, photography and botany. And in, there's a w wonderful essay by, by Will Coleman kind yeah. of talking a little bit in the catalog about the relationship between um, the photographs that Church collected and perhaps his own painting. I'm curious for you, um, thinking about, you know, what do you make of the connection between photography and painting in that way? What, do you, what would you say, kind of, after you've done this project as your grand thesis about church and, and photography and his relationship to these photographs that he's collecting? Oh. <laughs> I mean, you lost me. Another one I didn't send yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 yeah. it's fine. <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, I, could, I, could, I think I could theorize without church. Like, Go for it, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, and I, I think I'm wary of speculating with the information that I have about him and his relationship to photography and how he might have used it. Um, but uh, uh, in researching a lot of um, the photography that was being done at this period of time in the um, middle towards the end of the 19th century, um, trying to understand the usefulness of of, of photography as a kind of mode of rendering the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a wonderful essay I actually just read about uh, uh, Otto Marcius van Schreik, who was um, the um, uh, um, uh, Dutch uh, 17th century painter who developed uh, the genre Soto Bosco, which are um, essentially garden studies or gardens, or yeah, forests, forest studies or forest still lifes, looking down at the ground in the forest. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so this is a moment um, when uh, Clusius w uh, was um, uh, alive and gathering specimens. And um, in the essay, they're talking about the ability of, um, of painting and drawing to synthesize um, uh, the life cycle of a plant, to have, you know, um, mature leaves next to flowers, um, um, that typically would be, they wouldn't be concurrent. Mm. So photography is actually quite limited, right? Mm. In that it can only depict the moment, you know, that moment um, that it's bearing witness to. Um, and, uh, and so for a long time, even after the advent of photography, painting and illustration or drawing is actually far more useful mm -hmm. uh, to the field of botany and science mm. in its ability to describe um, a, a specimen in a, in a far kind of in a much fuller mm -hmm. um, manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that uh, Alexandra and I were talking about earlier uh, about the, the work specimen is that the piece is frozen, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in its kind of germinal stage, right? It'll never mature. And part of my choice of making it in bronze is also to kind of uh, memorialize that kind of moment, right? But while the forest kind of grows, a season happens, yeah, uh, the the uh, the fern fiddlehead kind of figuratively never loses its bloom. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's something, you know, there's there's something about photography in that. Yeah, yeah. And it strikes me that that process of kind of casting the fiddlehead in bronze, freezing this moment in time, also emulates in some ways or mimics the process of collecting. You know, collecting yeah. these botanical specimens, you're freezing this item totally. as a moment in time, and that was something that Isabel Church, Frederick's wife. Um, did quite a bit of, and so I think that I'm seeing that in a new light. I, specimen gives and gives and gives. It's a one. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've told you how how much I enjoy that work. But yeah, Thank you. wonderful. In fact, in fact, the, to your point, in the friend Van Schreik essay, they actually talk about they talk about um, uh, specimen collecting in the exact same way as 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 photography and the failures of both. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Something else that really has been so illuminating for me in this exhibition, being able to see these, this wonderful collection of 19th century photographs up in the galleries, is getting a further understanding in the context of the technology that was required of these, 
to make these pictures, right? I mean, this is a brand new technology in Church's time, and deepening my understanding of the immense labor that was required, mm. especially of these expeditionary photographs, photographs of these, these faraway places, um, photographs of these Mesoamerican um, uh, structures that were kind of hidden in jungle weeds that had to be cut down. I think that what I'm really struck by is just the mass amounts of human labor mm -hmm. that was required to um, develop these large glass plates, often wet, out in situ. I don't know if that's something that you, you thought a little bit about when you were selecting images or if that factored into your um, kind of thinking about terraforming as a framework. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. there's a fantastic book on on, on uh, Chalonet that I have um, where they actually describe the expeditionary force that was required in order. So he traveled with, I think, 30 laborers mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, spent several days uh, clearing uh, the ruins, which were thoroughly buried in vegetation and, 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 and dirt um, before he could he could photograph it. And so uh, terraforming, and there's even a kind of mm -hmm. uh, a refrain in the book where I kind of talk about mm -hmm. yeah, the uh, specifically um, um, Napoleon's force um, uh, it, during the invasion of, of Egypt. Um, so the, the idea of, of uh, archaeology as a kind of process of, um, but what does it mean? You know, is this the kind of rebirth or kind of reemergence of a kind of buried culture? Um, or with what's actually being, what's actually happening is that it's being annexed to satisfy the glory of a of, 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 of French empire, right? Mm -hmm. That it's actually a celebration of reason and of science and of, yeah, um, um, yeah. yeah. And so, um, there's, um, it's not just the kind of uh, act of, of, um, of shaping the landscape, but it's also trying to understand, um, there's another uh, reference to Charmaine Nelson, who's a fantastic uh, Canadian um, art historian, and she talks about um, uh, holding uh, depictions of landscape to account um, and trying to describe them in their actuality. Right, so a beautiful seascape that describes the harbor in Jamaica is not simply a beautiful seascape, you know, describing a pastoral scene. It's also a description of um, uh, plantation economies. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I love the kind of entanglement of, um, of imaging, but also how it how how we begin to understand the mechanisms of formation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it brings to mind you know just thinking about the the singular lens with which a, photo a photograph presents us, right? The singular view, the snapshot in time. So much easier to kind of use that singular snapshot to tell a specific story, to craft a specific worldview. I think that's something that really is kind of um, quite apparent in the in the context of this exhibition and is uh, wonderful for us all to think about if you come back to see the show again or if you've seen it before. Um, in the interest of time, I do, I have a lot of other questions we could go through, but I do want to make sure that we have about 15 minutes to chat and open up to other questions from the audience. Um, but you were thinking a little bit about landscape, and in the essay, in the catalog essay, you mentioned landscape losing its meaning across cultures and translations. You know, I can't help but focus on this as we're here, Frederick Church, landscape painter. Um, you explore the ways that we think about our contemporary landscape as fraught with the impacts of colonialism. But I'm curious, what does landscape mean to you, maybe before working on this show and after? If there has been a difference, if not, I don't know. Well, but, I think definitely, yeah. yeah, the opportunity to really dive deep and trap the essay um, was an was a chance to think explicitly about the term, um, its use, you know, as a genre, what's its capacity to hold specific approaches and, and, and ideas. Um, you know, um, one of the things that I begin the essay off with is a kind of useful description and the uh, the inability for uh, either English or German, which are two of the languages that I explore in terms of defining the term, since the word is very similar in both mm -hmm. languages. Um, but in English, how it describes um, um, uh, an image or a place, uh, an image or a place in, in uh, uh, geological terms, but in German, how it also describes a territory or um, a sense of enclosure. Uh, and so that kind of schism, you know, linguistically, 
or semantically is, is for me really interesting how when, when the term is described um, uh, in, one, in one language um, um, it, um, and how it succeeded um, by another language. Um, I'm really kind of, again, kind of trying to hybridize, you know, all of these different perspectives to, you know, I teach a class on landscape at, at, at Penn, uh, specifically because um, uh, I think it's a way within in which we can engage, um, um, engage the crisis in a way that's, uh, get, again, going back to this idea of kind of holding something at a distance, mm. you know, just far enough away that we can still embrace it, but at the same time kind of have a critical relationship with it. So, you know, it is about, okay, we're going to use the genre itself as a framework within which we're going to uh, begin to explore concepts of environmental precarity. Mm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so um, it gives us a lens or a door or a way into something which is um, uh, a hyper object, you know, almost too big to describe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, landscape has been, and I've come away with the sense of it being incredibly useful uh, for me to begin to understand um, where to start in terms of trying to understand or unpack that, that hyper object. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so much of your work, you know, I think kind of navigates those spaces, that space between you're doing this motion and it makes me think about some of your other projects in which, um, you know, humanity's relationship with something, with nature, with gardens, with botanical objects are, you're, you're inhabiting this space, this space between. Um, as we wrap up, I'd love, you know, for you to talk a little bit more about the 2017 project that you did in Philadelphia, For Everyone a Garden, or even the current project that's ongoing at the Glass House, um, A Colored Garden. I think these two, I'd l I don't know if you want to share anything about that. I think that there's something <coughs> fascinating there in terms of holding nature close but far. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think I'll, I mean, Cole Akers is here, so I, I think I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the Glasshouse project, um, uh, a colored garden, which again, you know, came with a very generous ex uh, invitation to start thinking about the site, uh, which is uh, the Glasshouse and Philip Johnson um, home and uh, estate, um, and um, uh, the history of that site um, and the history of him as an individual. Um, so, you know, there's so much kind of weight there, mm -hmm. you could almost call it a burden, you know, and uh, equally here, mm -hmm. you know, this is, these are spaces that are thoroughly authored. We understand them. That's why everybody's here is, you know, mm -hmm. to experience uh, the magnitude of these incredibly charismatic and colorful mm -hmm. figures, mm -hmm. you know, who made a deep impact on, 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 on uh, our culture. Um, but there are other histories that are also present, and so, uh, a house museum by its nature embraces a very specific narrative, you know? And um, in that act, it actively suppresses other narratives that are equally present, just not being given an opportunity to be um, celebrated perhaps mm -hmm. in the same way. And so some of the work is also about making space. Mm -hmm. It is about occupying, you know, um, uh, space and inviting in other narratives, other cultures, giving them a moment to kind of poke through the soil. And, and, uh, and so Specimen is also as much about bringing Jamaica and, and that legacy of landscape here. Mm -hmm. um, a, in the same way as um, A Colored Garden was an opportunity to explore uh, the history of, of, of landscape uh, from two distinct perspectives. The first was, um, um, uh, um, was Johnson's partner, David Whitney who was uh, an art collector and uh, um, also a, a very erudite individual, but also an active uh, gardener mm -hmm. who had an incredibly exuberant flower garden, or flower gardens that kind of um, um, moved through uh, the landscape. And as the uh, estate was being prepared for, um, uh, for transfer to the National Historic Trust, there was uh, Johnson kind of actively I don't want to say pruned, but kind of <laughs> did it like worked with it to make it uh, a more kind of rational mm -hmm. 
expression of um, um, modernist kind of pastoral um, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And um, what was sacrificed was, I think, the exuberance of Whitney's kind of uh, flowers. The second um, uh, narrative that I wanted to insert was um, um, an important African-American uh, still life uh, painter, uh, Charles Ethan Porter, who was active in Connecticut in the middle of the 19th century, or the end of 19th century or early 20th century. Uh, first African-American to uh, attend the Academy of Design in New York, uh, celebrated um, artist um, who, um, uh, whose work was supported actually by uh, mm -hmm. Frederick Church and his father, mm -hmm. uh, um, as well as um, uh, Mark by Twain. Mark Twain. Mark Twain, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as well as Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, his, um, his trip to, to study in Paris was, fu was funded by Twain. And uh, what I did is I actually made an inventory of all of the still lives painted by Porter and then designed a garden that would be in constant bloom from early spring to late fall. Um, and uh, the shape of the garden is a kind of architectonic form. It's a circle uh, that's in relationship to other sites um, on, the, on, on the grounds. And yeah, this kind of, um, you know, what we actually really see is, you know, this kind of emergence of another history. Mm on the site, it's sharing space, mm -hmm. you know, with this, this dominant narrative. And I think, you know, I think so much of what hap is happening today, there's a really important critique that's happening with uh, specific figures, you know, where people are being held to account for their actions. Um, um, but uh, I don't think that erasure is the only um, solution. You know, right. I think there's a way that these things can be brought into conversation together, mm -hmm. where we can both hold things to account, but also have them share space. Um, and so I think, um, you know, that was an opportunity for a, no a number of different voices to share space in a really mm. productive way. And I think that the same thing is happening here. Mm. Beautifully yeah. put. And I love that visual of kind of poking through the soil. Thank you so much for joining us and inviting us to, you know, shed a, an eye and open a new lens to these photographs that haven't been seen before, but also to new narratives and new stories that I think we've had the wonderful opportunity to to shine a light on, so I really, I really thank you. thank you. I'd love to open it up to audience questions, comments, you know, we'll stick around. We have wine and cheese, plenty to go around. Iced tea as well. Yeah? I don't mean to be simplistic about what you're saying, but I get the feeling that we're all aliens, even Frederick Church. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, you know, to collect these, you, you know, you're, you're not part of it, you're on the, you're looking into it. You're an outsider. Mm. We're an outsider looking at this. And talking about being an outsider, I'm curious how you came up with the two. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, like, I'm really now an alien because I'm sitting here saying, whoo, you know, what's that all about? So it, whose idea was that for the cover? <laughs> Did you have anything to do with that? And I'm sure Mr. Church didn't, but anyway. Enlighten me. So I actually designed the book, okay. um, which I'm very excited about. Um, and so yes, I have a lot to do with the cover. <laughs> um, so this is a one of the uh, famous photographs of the uh, Pyramid of Cholula, um, which is in the collection. Um, and so it's upstairs. Um, and then this is a the photograph that is um, um, rendered as a tapestry in, in, in the hallway. Um, and the, the title of the piece is actually uh, the histories after church, uh, version with xenoformed atmosphere, Rayleigh scattering spectrum shift. <laughs> <laughs> very alien. Very alien. It's very <laughs> alien. It's actually it, it it's actually imagining. There's a, a, a I think there's a, a, a short story that I wrote at the very end of the essay mm -hmm. that describes you know what Earth might look like mm -hmm. after being xenoformed, and so there's also a couple kind of proposition here that, you know, um, this idea of occupation, um, uh, again, trying to kind of create a hybrid, both deeply human and a post-human perspective within the same landscape image. And I'll just do a small plug. The bookstore is open till five, so go pick yourself up a copy and you can read, read more. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Maybe if you want to start us off and then, yeah. I, I, was, I was sort of a continuation a little bit. 
from that is you're using alien in a way that at least to the layperson is uh, perhaps you know suggests from another planet another space and not the human connection and in some ways to me uh, church looks on this as far as church is concerned uh, that we're talking about he's not going into these landscapes these foreign landscapes he's going in as a foreigner as a look out mm -hmm. onlooker but he is acknowledging shared humanity because he collects the artifacts pre-columbian he's recording details of the flora and fauna in a very botanical precise way as well as painting these giant pictures and so how do you uh, how do you differentiate between or maybe or assimilate foreign versus alien mm. so it's a great question and I, I, I move from um, a metaphorical one which is um, uh, um, more around the idea of coloniality. So it is about um, us as explorers of other cultures. Um, and the essay stays largely within that framework. But as I said earlier, and it's more in the conclusion, right? So we end with the short story and then there's a kind of brief um, concluding statement um, where I kind of make a proposal of Pacific landscape very deliberately as an attempt to kind of decenter the human, right? And so. I think that that's actually a deeply critical and important perspective to, to, to get, it was to also recognize that we're not at the center of things. What I actually begin the essay with is um, uh, Earth, um, uh, Earth from the point of view of a pre-human condition and how it took uh, millions of years of occupation of the planet um, by plants to simply establish atmosphere. Uh, and so, yeah, even to begin to think about concepts of coloniality is only to describe the last four or five hundred years, right? And so it's it's about recognizing the period of time within which church and, and ourselves, um, both kind of colonial and, and post-colonial, recognizing that moment, but also recognizing the larger bookends, which are before we got here and potentially after we've been mm -hmm. here. Um, and so it's, yeah, it is about kind of stretching the frame out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found in your exhibit, David, to be the most compelling and provocative were the photographs that had to do with coloniality in Mexico, mm -hmm. where you start out with a pristine jungle, and then you have cities evolving, very sophisticated cities that are then dominated by colonialists. Then the photographs are showing you, though, an aggressive attempt of nature to take back what humans had put in place, having visited both Chichen Itza and Uxmal, and I was able to climb the pyramids. So here we were again, trying to control what nature was doing in a very aggressive manner. So we're using aggression again to expose these pyramids. And I love going there because they are sacred sites. The saddest photograph for me was Cholula. Mm -hmm. Okay, that to me was, I mean, that's a tearjerker, if anything, all right? And even here, if you try to create a beautiful formal garden, leave it alone for just a couple of weeks, yeah. okay? And whatever was there is going to start to aggressively try to bring it back to its natural state. And you have terraforming right here at Olana, okay, where you have you start out with um, a beautiful, pristine, sublime natural state, and and then you have colonialists coming in and creating farmland. Nothing wrong with that. This is what I tell my guests. Nothing wrong with that. All right. But what does church do? He tries to bring it back to its original natural state, and then he builds this. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a constant terraforming happening here at home, and we're trying to do the same thing. Bring it back to its original state, the way church described it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think the exhibit is exquisite, Thank actually. you. Thank I you. I love it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, I mean, the relationship between 
the work and time is a complicated one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I think it is in many ways a kind of recognition that, you know, all of our effort is only kind of temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> I, it's funny because when you say that, it was just a staple in what you're saying, Ellen. With there was that one picture that stopped me in my tracks because it shows the colonialism having mm -hmm. the church on top of the pyramid. But the first time I saw that, it looked like a lana because it's uh, you know up on this hill where everybody mm -hmm. is. Oh, you know, here's this beautiful structure. Mm -hmm. But then you get deeper, you realize that is colonialism. It's taking on top of the sacred place here. And then also to think about things going back to nature, we just had a storm come through, and look mm -hmm. what the storm just did, you know, in just a few minutes. You know, mm -hmm. Take down trees that's been here for hundreds of years, these type of things, and now we'll clean it up and, and make it make it new again. Right. Mm -hmm. But it is that constant cycle. Mm -hmm. it's that constant cycle. Yeah. And that really did show that. So your eye was right on. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really intrigued by your project, My Building, Your Design. And I'm wondering if beyond creating specimen in your interaction with church's photographs, you had your own photographic interaction with this landscape and building. Mm. That's a great question. I mean, that was a project where I was invited by the, um, uh, the Mies van der Rohe Prize to photograph the finalists, um, seven locations around North and South America. And these were all buildings that had been photographed many, many times before by really talented architectural photographers um, and um, uh, so consequently the approach that I took was a quite an oblique one and the focus was really about not celebrating those buildings for you know their magnificence but trying to recognize and see them uh, from the perspective of people who inhabited them and so there was a kind of very I don't want to say snapshot but a very kind of vernacular aspect to the photography where it feels like photographs that you or I would take of each other in the building, uh, kind of intimacy. Um, it's interesting, like I have a very a strange relationship with documentation. Um, and so while I did shoot the documentary images of the, uh, the works installed for the book, um, that's something that I typically won't do. In fact, uh, Cole and I are working on a project, at, like an extension of the project of the Glass House, where we hired an incredibly talented uh, fashion photographer, Mark Borthwick, uh, to photograph the garden. And Mark is just such a fantastic ph photographer who can really kind of capture the vitality of the site in an um, almost magical way. Um, um, yeah, I think, again, like I, I like to have a kind of... Um, uh, a little bit of a distant relationship with my own uh, work um, as subject, mm -hmm. and um, and so um, some some places are just how do I say I can't figure out a way in, mm -hmm. yeah, or um, they're just so burdened with ways within which they've already been represented mm -hmm. that um, um, I don't think I can add anything, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm retired, but it's hard for me to shake off my science background. So, going by the numbers, church buys 7,000 photographs, is what he brings home. You sift through them, you kind of make a pile saying, okay, there's 2,000 photographs dealing with him as he travels. We're down to 150 photographs in the book, we're down to 50 that are up on the walls. Sure. How did you know how to do that as far as were you trying to represent the different places he went to? Are you looking at the significance of the photographs to say, okay, this should be really included? That's a really great question. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Like what the evaluative process was. Um, yeah, the first one was basically saying that I didn't want to open any boxes of photographs of people, so no anthropological photographs, just because that's a whole other kind of worm. Uh, so I said travel photographs, uh, landscape photographs, and photographs of archaeological sites. So that narrowed it down initially. Um, then there was... Um, we, we did an initial pass just looking at all of the images and just capturing the ones that um, I thought were interesting for one reason or another. Um, um, but then the final, uh, the final edit was both based on uh, geological or, or geographic diversity 
Uh, so different kinds of sites that represented different parts of the globe. But more particularly, they were all good photographs. And so really like an aesthetic judgment at the end of the day, um, even if they weren't in the best condition, there are some photographs that are in really poor condition but are beautiful photographs. Um, and so you also see a lot of my aesthetic judgment in that room, mm -hmm. I, I, which is not kind of any kind of empirical. Look at <laughs> 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 but, but at a certain point, yeah. It's intuitive, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it works well. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. All right, perfect. So I'll just do another plug. Our exhibition is on view until the end of October, please, if you haven't already. Um, see it, see it again, and stick around for some wine, grab a book in the store, it's open until 5. Thank you so much for joining us, it, it was a wonderful conversation, thank, thank you, you David. You.